Ever since the early 90s, the internet and video games have gone hand in hand. From the shareware days of the original Doom to the explosion of Xbox Live and beyond, gamers have been able to experience the joys of online gaming in a myriad of different ways. Experiencing a story through online co-op modes, sharing custom maps and levels across an entire community of aspiring designers, blasting each other away in a multitude of variants on deathmatches, the list goes on and on. Although I've played nearly hundreds of games online over a multitude of modes, worlds, arenas, and systems, the one online experience that keeps sucking me back in is Gears of War. Since 2006, I've been drawn to Gears of War's unique multiplayer over the traditional shooter online experience. The third-person perspective, the innovative cover system, fantastic map design, all contributed towards Gears being my number one choice for online deathmatches. My infatuation with Gears of War multiplayer stems from three main pillars of the gameplay formula. Symmetrical map design, power weapons and map control, and positioning and wall bouncing. These three aspects of Gears of War is what makes it stand out in a sea of multiplayer shooters. Let's start with the basics first before we dive into these core tenets so we can lay the groundwork. Gears of War is a cover-based third-person shooter. Players are equipped with three weapons, usually some sort of a rifle and a shotgun along with a pistol and a smoke grenade. In various game modes, all of which are unique twists on traditional multiplayer modes, players are tasked with eliminating the other team to secure a victory, whether that entails depleting the enemy's life pool disposing of a leader, or capturing a ring while defending it. Gears of War's core game mechanics work well to put control of the battle in the player's hands with a number of options to utilize in combat. Firing at enemies from afar or meleeing them up close are the obvious ones to point out, but there's more depth here. Being able to revive teammates who have been down to even a fight, utilizing innovative twists on a cover system such as meat shields, or nailing an active reload to not only speed up said reload, but also give your weapon a damage buff. The movement rides the line between heavy and quick, being able to slide into cover to avoid gunfire or roadie run to safety. The gunplay feels great with a fantastic sound design, making each shot feel guttural and impactful. There's a lot of minutia under the hood of Gears of War's gameplay mechanics that gives it its own personality and stands out from its competition. They're solidly designed games at their core, but these core three tenets that I've listed earlier are what makes Gears of War so special in my opinion. Level design has always interested me, specifically multiplayer map design. Having to balance the playability of a map with its theming and creativity is a tall order, and I feel Gears of War in its entirety has some of the best in the business. The main reason, at least in my opinion, is its commitment to symmetrical map design. While other shooters do this from time to time, Gears of War has stuck with this formula since the beginning, and it's for the best. While I understand comparing asymmetrical and symmetrical map design is like comparing apples to oranges, allow me to try. First off, let's look at Gears of War's most famous map, Gridlock, for example. Just like every arena, teams spawn on opposite sides of the map. The way this level is designed allows for a few routes to be taken. You can rush the center where the most powerful explosive weapons like the boom shot spawn. You can assist anyone crazy enough to do that by getting a height advantage on the balcony across the way. Doing so, though, could provide dangerous if your team loses control of the boardwalk where the long shot spawns, giving a perfect sight line to lose your head if you're not careful. Everything I just laid out and more can happen for both teams based on the Maps design, creating a balanced fight, ensuring that the match, at least from a positioning standpoint, is even and fair. There's never a time in Gears of War where a team may spawn with an advantage like the higher ground or a better power weapon. The best maps in Gears history combine great level design with balanced power weapon and team spawns, tying it all together with a unique and interesting visual aesthetic. Some of my favorites have to be, of course, the classic gridlock, blood drive with its opposing staircases that add some verticality to firefights, as well as the number of different flanking routes, Gears of War 3's version of Jacinto that loops in on itself multiple times and has a great selection of power weapons each round, check out set in a rundown and abandoned grocery store, and finally Old Town whose lively and colorful fishing town aesthetic is a harsh but welcome juxtaposition to Gears of War's usual city design. Some maps even utilize game-changing mechanics that players have to either avoid or use to their advantage, such as Tyro Station's train that runs through the middle of the map, Bullet Marsh that features the series' terrifying krill enemies that kill anyone who isn't standing in a well-lit area, and one of my favorites, Thrash Ball, a Gears of War-inspired football stadium with a precariously damaged Jumbotron hanging from the ceiling. Gears of War has had a consistently great track record with map design, and it was pretty difficult to choose some of my favorites since the majority are worth pointing out. That's not to say Ace symmetrical map design is objectively worse, but compare something like Overgrowth, one of my favorite maps from Call of Duty 4, to one of the largest maps in Gears of War 3, Sandbar. I know, I know, apples and oranges, but just hear me out for a second. In Sandbar, each team spawns with the exact same weapons and avenues of attack as the other. Teams can rush the fortress or overlick area, flank around underneath, or head towards the cargo ship to take the long way around. Any route or action taken by the player, the opposing team has the opportunity to do the same, meaning the tide of 
of the battle is shifted only by the abilities of the player and not some advantage given to you by a lucky spawn. Now let's check out Overgrowth, again one of my favorite maps in Call of Duty 4. The main areas of the map are split down the middle by the riverbed, with houses and structures on either side connected by bridges. Where you can divide the map down the center of the river and each side has a similar design, there are still advantages on one side over the other that throw off the balance. The barn on one side of the river has great sight lines and a decent place to hold up and snipe from, whereas what would be its equivalent, this gas station over here, is almost never utilized by players due to it not having as much of an advantage. Call of Duty and Gears of War are definitely two completely different games with two completely different gameplay styles, and while I like both franchises, I have to give Gears the edge based on how balanced and deceptively simple yet complex its map design is. This is consistent across every map in almost every game, which means winning is based more on the next pillar of Gears of War multiplayer's pantheon, power weapons, and map control. It doesn't matter how beautiful, creative, or balanced a map is, if you're not controlling it, you're losing. Power weapons are a staple of the arena shooter genre, and similar to games like Halo or Doom, Gears of War has a plethora of game-changing weaponry on the battlefield. From the aforementioned boom shot that can eviscerate a team with one well-placed shot, to more creative and unique weapons like the explosive charging torque bow, the digger or drop shot that renders cover obsolete, or any number of wacky and effective weapons that can turn the tide of battle with one shot. Controlling these weapons is the key to success, and utilizing effective teamwork to commandeer these essential chess pieces is equally as fun and rewarding as it is risky. Being tied directly into the symmetrical map design, power weapons usually will spawn at a point of contention, a center area where both teams will inevitably clash, like my gridlock example of the boom shot or the long shot spawn. Although sought after for their additional firepower, their balanced spawns and placements make them keys to opening up new offensive routes to be taken. Matches will sometimes boil down to both teams pushing hard for one or both power weapons, and the tactic that arise from these battles are always exciting. Do you flank the opposition to get the drop on them while they're fighting over the boom shot, or do you push a full team to overpower them and take it for yourself? If you lose the fight for the torque bow, do you fall back and try to defend, or do you push back and try to outmaneuver the explosive bolts? These scenarios are key to the excitement of Gears of War's moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Just because you control the power weapons doesn't mean you control the match, though, and map control is just as integral to winning as blowing heads off with the long shot is. Since maps are designed with symmetry in mind, there's usually one or two spots in each map that are always fought over, particularly at or near the center of the map. Controlling these spots puts your team on the offensive, making the opposition rethink their strategies when trying to make a comeback. And since the maps are symmetrical, these control points are usually vulnerable from multiple directions, meaning defending the area can be very difficult. Control of the power weapons and the hot spots are integral to achieve victory, and balancing these important tactics is the best kind of challenging. In any other online shooter, maps and game modes are designed in such a way that these instances are few and far between. Being on the move is a more effective tactic, and unless prompted by a flag to capture, a point to hold, or the urge to camp, map control points rarely crop up in other online arenas. But controlling the map is difficult if you can't master Gears of War's metagame, so to speak, positioning and wall bouncing. Gears of War is a special kind of shooter. Similar to Halo in many ways, there's a myriad of weapons to choose from that are all enjoyable to use. But in a rare instance of people agreeing online, the community has come together to utilize one singular weapon over any other. For Halo, that's the Battle Rifle, and for Gears of War, that's the Nasher. Occasionally players will use Lancers or Hammer Bursts, but 9 times out of 10, the Nasher is king. Battles will usually boil down to 1 vs 1 Nasher battles, and those who can land the best shots and manipulate the cover system to their advantage wins. This is a technique known as wall bouncing, and it's probably one of the most interesting game mechanics Gears of War has. From the onset, wall bouncing seems to be the result of the cover system in the game being exploited by the player base. Essentially, the game will register that a player is close to a wall or a piece of cover, and with the press of A, players will slide into said cover. While performing the animation of taking cover, players will angle the camera towards another desired cover spot and hit A again. The result is players bouncing from wall to wall to either speed up, avoid incoming fire, or outmaneuver their opponent. There are many different variations on this maneuver that can allow you to gain the upper hand in a fight. What was once an exploit of the game's cover mechanics seems to have been adopted by both the community and the developers, as future titles have implemented easier ways of pulling this tactic off and designing certain sections of maps where wall bouncing is not only possible, but preferable. While it's not essential for enjoying the game, mastering this technique is oddly satisfying and rewarding. Take a look at any MLG or pro matches for Gears of War and you'll see this technique being utilized to its full potential. It's pretty impressive to say the least.
Going hand in hand with wall bouncing is your positioning. It seems obvious to say that staying in cover and away from bullets is the best strategy to survive, but in Gears of War it's a little bit more complex than that. There's two main ways your positioning can help in a firefight. Number one, weapon positioning. This primarily concerns the Nasher, but can be useful for weapons like the long shot or the boom shot as well. Like most shooters, Gears of War has blind, hip fire, and the ability to aim down sights or ADS. And like most shooters, using ADS will slow down your movement as well as your aiming speed, making you vulnerable as well as an easy target. Combining precise and quick snaps of ADS with positioning the enemy in the center of your screen will be the edge in a 1 vs 1 Nasher battle. Slowing down is definitely the quickest way to your death. And number two, cover positioning. While positioning your weapon is key to the kill, positioning yourself is just important. Taking cover and opening fire is good for longer range fights, but close quarters combat requires a more subtle touch. Positioning yourself behind cover but not attached to said cover gives you more freedom to dodge incoming fire or maneuver around the cover to get a better shot. Knowing when to combine this tactic with wall bouncing, vaulting, or dodging is the best approach to outplaying your opponent. There are other aspects of Gears of War's multiplayer that I've grown to love over the years that can't really be fit into these three core tenets I've laid out. Although in the cooperative space, Horde Mode has not only revolutionized the genre and industry as a whole, but has been a blast to play online with friends. Defending areas, setting up defenses, seeing how long your group can hold out. Horde Modes and gaming are a dime a dozen nowadays, but Gears of War has been able to innovate on this mode it had spawned nearly 10 years ago to keep it fresh and exciting. One of Gears of War's most well-known attributes is its dedication to over-the-top gore. Blowing a head clean off as a fountain of blood spews out, dismantling an enemy with a well-placed gnasher to the gut, or performing one of the many creative and bloody executions are always a spectacle on top of being rewarding. This is emphasized by the excellent sound design I alluded to earlier. The meaty and chunky sound of impacting bullets, the overheating of a lancer towards the end of its clip, or the one-liners your character spout oh, how sweet it is! are all enhancements on the audio front. On the topic of character Characters, they're also a great part of the Gears of War ecosystem. While purely cosmetic, they add an extra flair to matches, being able to pick your favorite soldier from the campaigns for the COG, or the most badass monstrosities for either the Locust or the new Swarm enemies. My go-tos for the COG are the Carmine brothers, specifically Anthony and Clay, as well as Dom and Bernie. On the Locust or Swarm side, I prefer the more foreboding creatures like General Rom or the Theron guards. While Gears has its positives, just like everything in life, it's not all perfect. Matchmaking was particularly janky in the early days of Gears 1 and 2, with the recent titles being a little bit more stable. Overpowered weapons plagued Gears of War 3 like the sawed-off shotgun and the retro lancer, and Gears of War 4 has unfortunately implemented loot box and microtransactions, replacing a more rewarding and enjoyable progression system from Gears of War 3. I'm gonna play this machine, I like this machine. Come on, let's get some winners here, let's show these people how to be a winner, there's nothing nothing Nothing, nothing. <laughs> And don't even get me started on Gears of War Judgment, oh, Jesus Christ. For all its faults, the uniqueness of the Gears of War's multiplayer suite has lived on for more than 10 years now, and even though it couldn't possibly live up to its older Xbox brother in Halo, it's still one of Microsoft's most important intellectual properties in my opinion. Like Halo, it emphasizes skill over spray and pray gunplay, on top of expertly designed levels and some badass weapons to wield. With Gears 5 on the horizon, I'm eager to see where this franchise will go story-wise, but I'm sure I'll be coming back to its multiplayer component for years to come.